Baldi is going to give our second talk uh, this morning in the statistics about extremes. And uh, she came back into the NCAR group this last year, I think it was. And so after being here for a while at NCAR before that, and then a stint at Climate Central, and she's still a, a visiting fellow or something like that at, at uh, Climate Central, and I'll give it over to her. Um, the number of equations in my talk uh, average out the number of equations in Steve's talk. So uh, we're going to go back to a normal amount of equations. Um, so the idea for my talk is to talk about uncertainty and extremes, like this a very uh, pity title says. And um, in particular, I want to focus on uh, this idea of um, extreme event attribution, which is a fairly uh, new, relatively speaking, and kind of, uh, I don't know, salient use of, of the um, apparatus of detection and attribution for um, attributing the uh, effects of anthropogenic climate change to particular single events that have uh, usually some um, damages atta attached to them. Uh, but to do that, I need to walk you through what detection and attribution is to start with. So there is such a thing as detection and attribution in general that doesn't have to do only with single events, but attributes, you know, trends or um, patterns that have to do more with the long-term changes in our system. And then I'll uh, focus on this event attribution idea, and I'll tell you about the methodologies that have been uh, proposed, and I'll make some examples. <coughs> so if I hadn't been very busy or very lazy, I would have very uh, recent examples for you. But in fact, I've been both busy and both lazy. <laughs> and um, the examples are fairly uh, old, but they are also the, the first uh, um, papers that have been written about this that remain kind of the paradigm for this methodology. So they are not stale, at least. They are not um, surpassed by anything that I know uh, that would make them too old for you. Um, OK, uh, if we have time, we also are going to talk more in general about changes in extremes in the future. And to do that, I'm going to tell you what the last FECC assessment has thought as um, come up with in terms of uh, um, you know the, the projections from from our models and uh, given that I'm supposed to talk about uncertainty I would focus on the specific challenges in characterizing uncertainties in these uh, projections okay so that's the plan we'll see how long and how far we go uh, so detection and attribution um, how many of you know what detection and attribution is one Ooh, okay, good. So um, as some of you know, uh, detection and attribution uh, have, has to do with the idea of recognizing that something is changing in our system, in our climate system, um, both the physical aspects of it and more recently uh, also apply to other aspects like more related to impacts, like you know, system ecosystems or even social systems. Um, so the idea of recognizing that something is changing and the idea of attributing the sources, the causes of those changes. So one thing is to say, yes, something here is no longer like it used to be. And, and another um, you know, step is why. And so that's the way of distinguishing what detection is, which is this idea of recognizing that there is a statistically significant change in the characteristics of things like you know, temperature, precipitation, extremes. And attribution, which, is, which tries to apportion the uh, sources of these changes between natural changes that can happen even on long-term scales, natural external forcings that can be you know, the solar cycle or volcanoes affecting, at least for a while, the statistics of, of um, the climate system, or, or 
and most importantly, our effects on the system that have to do mainly with uh, emissions of uh, greenhouse gases, but also things like you know, land use change and uh, other uh, forcings that we are imposing on the system. I don't, I don't have to tell you to interrupt me, right, if you, if you need me to, to stop and explain. Please do. Um, so um, detection attribution has some formal you know, methodologies that it has developed over the years. And um, a lot of the formal methodology has to do with this idea of fingerprints, this idea that um, each specific forcing that you apply on the system affects it in a way that manifests itself in, in, a, in a form that you can recognize and you can characterize. So to be a little less abstract, you know, if you think of the effects that just greenhouse gases have had on trends in temperature over the globe, people have recognized that these uh, patterns of changes, these patterns of trend over the globe, the fact that you know, trends are higher in the high latitudes and uh, lower in the middle to low latitudes, the fact that the um, uh, land is warming more than the ocean. So this geographic um, emergence of trends has, um, has a pattern that is specific to the fact that greenhouse gases have affected these changes. Solar um, forcing would have a different pattern. A volcano would have a different pattern. So the idea is that we can use models to estimate these patterns. And then we can take observations and see how those patterns um, explain what we actually see in observations, which is, by definition, going to be noisy and mixed up because all the four things are going to operate at the same time. But what we can do with models is we can run a model where only greenhouse gases change, or only solar forcings change, or only volcano go off. And um, we can estimate these patterns on the basis of, of these controlled experiments. We can also use models to just look at a system that has been left undisturbed. So we can run the models without greenhouse gas increases, without the solar cycle changing, without volcanoes going off. Um, and that, when we observe the statistics of, of temperature precipitation and everything else coming out of these simulations, gives us an idea of what the system would do left alone. And that helps us because uh, we are going to use those kind of simulations to uh, characterize the noise of the system. So again, trying to go a little bit more formal and in detail, but really this is, I think, is my only, only uh, equation. And it's a linear regression, so it shouldn't be scary. Um, <laughs> This is the idea, both in pictures and in, uh, in the form of an equation. Um, let's say I'm interested in uh, changes in temperature expressed as trends in degrees C per decade. And let's say I have observations that for a, a good chunk of the, of the globe give me these trends. So I've, I've taken observations, I've computed trends over this period, 1901 to 2005 in this case. Um, and for each location, I can compute the trend, I can express it in this, in, form, in this form. Then I can take a model, and I can run it with anthropogenic forcing changes, only those. The solar cycle, the volcanoes are kept constant. And then I can run the same model with only those natural forcings changing. And for that kind of simulation, I can compute trends exactly like I did on observations. And you see that when you do that for anthropogenic um, forced simulations, you get patterns of change in temperature. You actually get trends. While you do the same for um, natural only forcings, and as you expect, because you should know by now that at least over this century long um, length, you don't really expect trends to, to be significant. You may expect them on much shorter windows. You see that the, the picture shows you that there is not much going on. Um, we are all around zero here. So the idea is that now I build a regression where I take this sort of information as my variable to be explained, and this kind of um, 
data from models as my explanatory variables. And I just fit a regression, and I ask, uh, um, how does this coefficient look? Is it significant? In particular, is it the part that you know, is um, uh, giving me the, the effects of the anthropogenic forcing significant? Or maybe I don't need any of these to explain my observation. Maybe it's all noise. In, the, in that case, my beta would be not significant. OK, so this is the basic idea behind a lot of detection and attribution studies. Of course, you can change y to be something else than trends in temperature. It could be trends in precipitation, for example. Um, you can put different things here if you're interested in effects of, for example, land use change. You could have a, a simulation that tells you what those trends are under only land use change, or things like ozone, or other form aerosols. Um, so, so the idea is to structure this, this analysis by saying, I have something that explains possibly these changes. Is it really true? Uh, are they, they significant in this regression? And of course, you should stop me and say, wait a second. Are you really saying that everything is so linear, so additive? There is nothing else going on here? And um, of course, if I were interested in something much more complicated than linear trends in temperature, it may well be the case that I cannot get away with just you know, formulating this as a nice linear regression. But it turns out that for a lot of things that the detection and attribution research has looked at, the framework of a linear regression actually works fairly well. In particular, it works fairly well when you characterize the, um, is it working at all, or am I just uh, moving? Yeah, OK. Well, um, I should use this then. No, I can't because I have my, my nice presentation setting. Anyway, the epsilon there uh, is not just a simple you know, white noise, um, independent, identically distributed term. Um, as I said, we actually use climate model simulations that undisturbed sort of simulation to estimate what the epsilon should be. So once you do that, this framework actually works fairly well. If you were just trying to estimate this regression with, with IID um, normal, um, um, <laughs> independent, and identically distributed error terms, um, that probably would fall apart. Or at least if you actually plotted your data like somebody does every now and then, you would see that the, re the residuals wouldn't satisfy your, your assumptions. Uh, but if you actually use uh, climate model simulations to estimate that variability there, actually this works. OK, so um, yeah, Rachel, of all people. <laughs> So my question is about the, I'm guessing, the GCM models that you use in this case. So does the quality of that model directly influence these results? Um, and is that something that is a major concern in the detection and attribution? Yes, it is. OK. Uh, yeah, and that's the reason why you know uh, a lot of um, things, aside from temperature and pre precipitation and average values at a pretty large scale don't work. Because uh, a premise of all this is that you have to trust that your model is able to replicate observations fairly accurately and fairly um, yeah, uh, faithful, faithfully. And, and it's not the case for many variables, many regional scales. And, and um, yeah, so that's, that's the gist of it. A good point. So. Um, so I, I already told you a little bit of this. Uh, you set up this regression analysis, and really detection attribution amounts to ask two you know, hypothesis testing sort of questions. Are these uh, coefficients significant? And in the case of you know, the um, more traditional detection and attribution thing, uh, is the coefficient in front of the anthropogenic forcing uh, statistically different from one or not. And if it's uh, not uh, different from one, then you you are um, detecting and attributing as well. Um. <laughs> we can hear you. Oh, no, because we're well past. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so I, maybe you're going to go into this, but this is done at each grid point. 
correct? Or how is oh, this actually, done? Those, those beta coefficients are, so if you think of this regression, you would string out this, uh, this picture in a long vector, and it would be your y. Ah, so all of the grid yeah, points so, are so the beta okay. applies to the pattern. That's the fingerprint. That's right. So the, the fingerprint, is, I should have said that, actually, so good that you asked. What we call fingerprint is actually this kind of picture. So this is the fingerprint of uh, CO2 um, emissions on temperature trends. This is the fingerprint of uh, natural forcing on temperature trends. And, and those are the explanatory variables, and beta would, would be in front of those. Oh, it doesn't work. Maybe the, 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 the other one. How did I get this, this one in, in my hands? Well, we okay. gave you another one that will work as a pointer. Oh, not right now? Yeah, the oh. one that I just gave you. I, I, I'm jet lagged. I didn't even notice that. OK, so. Um, <laughs> okay. OK, whatever. So I, as I said, you know, you set up the regression analysis, and you ask, uh, first of all, the, are the coefficients significant? Because that's the detection part. If nothing is changing significantly, it's all noise. You are not detecting anything going on. If that is true, then you ask, you know, what's the relative magnitude of these coefficients? Is, is the anthropogenic uh, component relevant, significant, all that? Okay, now uh, that would be the formal way to do it, and of course there are a little more, you know, sophisticated ways to do it, but that's the basic idea. Um, there are less formal um, approaches where you just take, you know, these uh, uh, climate sim model simulations that have been run with everything in it, um, anthropogenic forcings, natural forcings, all of it, and you take climate simulations where you are not imposing anthropogenic forcings to change over time, and then you compare what comes out. And you, you, know, you make a nice plot, for example, of um, global average temperature time series for those simulations that include everything and those simulations that not, don't include it. And um, these are the kind of plots that you see in the last uh, IPCC report. I think, yeah, this is the summary for policymakers. So one of these uh, plots is showing you temperature changes over time then from 1910 through 2010. So this is the observed period. The detection attribution applies to the observed period. Um, and the black line is observations. And the um, pink envelope is supposed to represent the behavior of these uh, simulations that have everything, that the, our best estimate of historical forcings and um, solar cycle, volcanoes, everything. And the blue ones are representing the behavior of simulations where you leave everything out but the natural thing. So you don't impose changes in CO2, ozone, nothing, uh, uh, anthropogenic aerosols. You just use solar cycle volcanoes. And um, you see that for most of these areas, and you can tell these are fairly large areas, North America, North Atlantic, South America, Antarctica, Africa. For most of these, if you want to explain observations, you have to have the simulations accounting for the changes in CO2 historically. So this is a, it's not a formal analysis. It's just uh, you know eyeballing. But it's um, representing the fact that um, it, it looks like without our eff effects on, on the system, we cannot really explain what went on historically. Yeah. It takes me a while from the, <laughs> to realize that you're waiting for the microphone. Like, yes, you have a question, please. Um, so th this has been the first week that I've really started to um, at least learn about detection and attribution. One of the things that I guess is confusing me is the very models that are producing these two different sets of results are calibrated to observations through a hind casting process. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So the. <laughs> Um, it's 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 a kind of a thorny question, but it's not as easy as it sounds. Like it's not that these models can be tuned to replicate, uh, you know, the um, temperature in South America without screwing up temperature somewhere else, because you you cannot you don't have enough degrees of freedom to tune everything to replicate what what you observe. And of course. Um, yes, it's true that you know if a model doesn't replicate the most uh, obvious trends observed, it would be thrown out of the window, and something else would be worked out. But um, the way these models are developed, 
they have to satisfy all sorts of constraints. And so it's not like you know, fitting a statistical model to replicate observations and then validating it on the same observations. It's not, it's not as simple as that. But there is, you know, uh, it's not to say that there isn't any tuning and this is not kind of a, an, a, a in, in a, how do you say, inbreeding or <laughs> no. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, it's just not as obvious as saying, yeah, these are, have been calibrated, so this is totally uh, dishonest. <laughs> Any other question? For example, what, what are the effects of a slowdown that typically models cannot reproduce, the, the recent slowdown in the global warming? Oh, the hiatus? Yeah. What are the effects? Yeah, on attribution studies. For example, it really breaks down if you, if you include the... Uh, well, you know, uh, as, I, as I showed you, there is actually a beta coefficient there. So um, we are not saying that the models have to replicate exactly point by point what's going on. Uh, so right now, at least, you know, within um, uh, the, the envelope of uncertainty attached to this kind of regression, the hiatus is still consistent with our understanding and our models. Not all of them. Some of them uh, have been shown to be a little too warm um, for, for this particular period. There is nothing that tells us that they are too warm then going forward. Um, so, so for now, I don't think anybody is, uh, you know, not sleeping at night in the detection attribution community. But um, it has it has served, for example, to revise a little downward some estimates of quantities like the trends in climate response that um, have a dis probability distribution, and it has been pushed a little bit to the left, but um, still consistently with all the results. But now, if you ask me the same question in 10 years and we're still in the hiatus, I would have a very different <laughs> answer. <laughs> so, OK. Um, uh, yeah, so we, we talked about this um, already. The fact that the error term is really crucial. If you don't characterize the error term faithfully to what we understand is the natural variability in our, um, in our system, your, your regression approach falls apart. And of course, it's not as easy as I make it sound. I mean, this, this long-term variability, natural variability, um, it's, it's not as easy to observe, for example, because we don't have long enough uh, observation of an undisturbed system. We only have observations of a system that has been um, contaminated by CO2. And so it, it's a little bit of a... Of a um, you know, act of faith in our models to take these control simulations and check that all in all what we see as variability even on this long-term scale looks um, like something we can, for example, estimate from proxy records and things like that. Um, so, so as I said, you know, the, besides this formal approach and, and the less formal approach, the approach that I showed you with those time series, there are even um, uh, what? Oh, did I? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I knew I knew I had something else in terms of less formal, but that, that stuff, the first stuff I had already told you. So um, the other way to do detection and attribution, when you cannot do it directly, as, as I said, even in response to Rachel's question, there are some variables that we know that our models are not good at replicating. So you cannot go and do the fingerprint approach and then construct your regression. And for those, probably the regression, the linear, um, the linear um, approximation wouldn't hold anyway. So the way people do things, for example, for extreme temperatures, um, they do it in two steps. They first relate the change in extreme temperatures, for example, to changes in the mean. And then they attribute the change in the mean. So it's kind of you know, um, uh, one degree removed uh, uh, causality uh, step here. So for example, we will see in a moment when we when people actually attributed, in this case, an extreme event and a single event, the heat wave in Europe in 2003, they didn't try to attribute it directly. Uh, they said uh, the fact that we had this really big heat wave was uh, um, helped by the fact that summer temperatures in Europe have shown an increasing trends over the last decades. 
And then they took those um, increasing trends in average temperature over a big box covering Europe and attributed that with the formal detection and attribution. Because we know that our models are much better at replicating these large scale trends over time rather than particular event, particular events of, of the extremity <laughs> of like um, um, that heat wave. And the same thing happens, for example, with um, this effect on, with sea level rise. Sea level rise, you know, our models are not really good at, um, at um, uh, simulating sea level rise, uh, replicating sea level rise, because they don't account for all the factors that go into sea level rise. But we know that a big part of sea level rise has to do with very straightforward things. Ocean water getting warmer and expanding in volume, glaciers melting. So we can attribute that more directly because it's a very uh, direct effect of increasing temperatures. So once you do that, then you know that at least a part of sea level rise you have attributed to um, anthropogenic effects. You may not be able to say how much exactly, um, uh, as much as you would do in a, in a formal direct attribution step, but at least you can, by these um, two steps, attribute part of it. Um, OK, I wanted to just give you an idea of um, how little, actually, <laughs> um, detection uh, and attribution statements in uh, the AR5, the last IPCC report, there is. Um, it's really hard to attribute extremes. And, and this is um, you know, um, a proof of it. So you go to the, um, to the chapter that does detection attribution, which in, in this time around was chapter 10. And you, you try to find any statement that has to do with attribution of extremes. And you find these four. The first one is related to temperatures, of course, because it's easier to attribute everything related to temperature. It's the, the most uh, you know, direct effect of anthropogenic CO2 emissions. So anthropogenic forcing has contributed to the observed changes in the frequency and intensity of daily temperature extremes on the global scale since the mid 20th century. And this is very likely with high confidence. Then in land regions where observational coverage is sufficient for assessment, anthropogenic forcing has contributed to global scale intensification of heavy precipitation over the second half of the 20th century. But this statement doesn't have a likelihood attached to it, which has to do more with the quantitative assessment, and it has just medium confidence. So even you know, for a very generic statement like this, there is only medium confidence. Human influence has substantially increased the probability of occurrence of heat waves in some locations. It's likely with high confidence, but again, it's related to temperature. And this is attribution of changes in tropical cyclone activity, hurricanes, low confidence in any human influence so far. There's nothing else about uh, extremes in the detection attribution chapter. OK, so now we can start talking about individual extreme events. And why is it uh, so, um, well, important, I guess, to, to um, try and attribute the effects of anthropogenic forcings on the changes or, or on the occurrence and the intensity of a specific ex extremes that we actually experience? Um, well, th there is like a benign way to justify this and a more like um, conflictual way to characterize this. So you can argue that if you um, can say that, for example, a heat wave has been caused for a significant fraction by our anthropogenic emissions, and going forward, we know that unless we don't do anything, those are just, you know, um, meant to, to increase, then you better prepare for those events, because we know they are going to become more likely. So people justify this interest in attributing individual weather events from an adaptation point of view. Uh, even you know, uh, the, pro the problem of allocating resources and giving money around for this adaptation. So you may want to uh, favor areas where you have seen these events happening and you have attributed them, at least in part, 
to anthropogenic forcings, and you may want to, with all the funds from other areas and other kind of extreme events where you haven't demonstrated that they are related very much at all with our uh, anthropogenic forcings. Um, does anybody has, have anything to, to counter point to that? <laughs> Is it a convincing argument? <laughs> Um, I mean, I, nobody says anything. I'll tell you that. I mean, to me, I don't really need to attribute specific extreme events to do adaptation. I think, you know, just looking at what we understand about future projections uh, is enough to, to guide a location. But anyway, that's one way to, to justify putting resources into this kind of research. But even more, uh, yes. <laughs> Now somebody has some, something to say. <laughs> Are people talking about this in terms of uh, legal responsibility? I was about I mean, to get the, there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so the, the other more, uh, like I say, conflictual um, approach to this is that you can actually, um, at, if you can actually attribute an increase in the risk of some events that have caused damages, you can actually go then out and try to find those responsible for this uh, increase in risk. And if you're saying that emissions are uh, contributing to the risk, you may you know, start uh, suing uh, emitters of CO2. Um, so, or if you are a developing country, you may want to ask the developed countries that have emitted all this CO2 to help you rebuild you know, after Kayan as, as wreck havoc um, in, your, in your country. So there is this aspect that is definitely a little more, um, uh, may have uh, uh, really important consequences. And the interesting part of this, I learned, I think, is that to prove things like that in a, in a court, you only have to prove you know, that, that, this, that this reality uh, is, is um, well, that this, that this fact, that you believe this fact in more than 50%. Chances, so you don't. The, the the level of proof, the standard of proof, is not that high. You you only have to convince the court that this was more likely by fifty percent. Yeah. Well, the criminal also, I think, it's it's a it has much higher standards. But uh, for 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 damages, I think it would be enough a civil lawsuit. So. Um, I'll, sh I'll tell you how the problem has been approached. And um, there are different ways to approach it. And I'm using some examples. And again, that's why I'm saying I'm using old example. 2003 heat wave, 2000 UK flood, 2010 Moscow heat wave, 2011 Texas drought. Um, so, so this is just a picture that shows you how hot 2011 was and how, oops, the drought was, was pervasive. Um, and um, I, I don't really want to say more about this, but um, what is my stuff about? Sorry. OK. Um, yeah, I guess this was just. Um, an overview of, of, of these things, you know, uh, the, the, the drought, the Russia heat wave, uh, the December 2010 in the UK that was actually a particularly cold December. That so this idea that when you do this um, event attribution, it would be a little too comfortable to just take the very high extremes that are you know um, consistent with your understanding of what anthropogenic forcing does to the system. And you would like to be a little more objective. And so you want to study also things that go counterintuitive to what you expect. So the fact that there was a particularly cold winter now challenges you to say, you know, uh, what, how can you uh, make this consistent with, with your understanding of, of the effects of CO2? And of course, in this case, um, the, the scientists showed that the uh, probability of such an event was made much, much lower by anthropogenic forcing, but still not zero. So, um, OK, so um, you always hear this. Uh, you, you always hear that um, it's really not possible to attribute a single event to uh, anthropogenic forcing, so because um, there are chances that even very extreme events would happen in a system that is uh, left alone. 
Um, but um, you can approach it from a probabilistic point of view. Like you can say, well, what was the probability of observing this event in a system that was undisturbed, and what's the probability now that we have actually kicked the system somehow? And so the approach about um, event attribution, for the most part, has to do with this idea of calculating these probabilities and comparing them. Uh, so you, in a way, you are, you are then uh, left with attributing the fraction of the risk that has changed from an undisturbed system and is attributable to anthropogenic forcings. And the idea is that you know, for a certain event, you may have a neutral or null uh, distribution that has to do with your system you know, without CO2 and other forcings. And then you, you may have the probability distribution of uh, the same event under uh, forcings, uh, CO2 and others from, from our activity activities. If your event is, for example, defined by the exceedance of a certain threshold, you know, that day was, uh, you know, 112, so uh, this may be the threshold of 110, and you are asking what was the probability of observing such a hot day, well, you have a certain uh, P0 probability that is the tail here in the green. I don't know if you can actually see yeah, this green. Sorry, there is a green here and there is a little tail here. But now if we move the distribution by warming the system, um, this probability all of a sudden becomes much larger, is P1. And you can define a quantity that people like to look at. It's called fraction of attributable risk. And it's this quantity that says 1 minus P0 over P1. And so it tells you by how much uh, the um, anthropogenic forcing has changed the probability, um, relatively speaking, of, of this event. Um, my understanding is that this is a concept that is used in um, epidemiology or um, you know things like how much uh, tobacco increases the probability of developing lung, canc lung cancer. You can look at a population that doesn't smoke and you come up with the green um, and then um, a population that smokes and, and you come up with the red distribution. Now, don't ask me what the threshold there was, would be, but um, you, you understand the analogy. And so the first uh, study that applied this methodology was by Peter Stott, who is at the UK Met Office, and Miles Allen, and I think it was Dahi Stone that looked at the um, infamous heat wave in the summer of uh, 2003 in Europe. And you remember it affected a lot of countries, but especially France, as you can tell from this map that shows you temperatures in, the, uh, in, the, in those days. Um, France was particularly badly affected, and there were you know, thousands and thousands of excess deaths. Um, and uh, the first thing they did was to look at just average summer temperatures here, and what had happened for Europe over the years. And they found this, this would be the, the red line um, that, I'm sorry, uh, let's see, I think it must be the black line. So they found that um, summer temperatures have indeed started increasing over the decades. So there was this behavior that was already hinting to the uh, you know, effects, possibly, of greenhouse gases. And then they did a formal detection attribution analysis of average summer temperatures using those fingerprints and um, you know, those regression framework, and they were able to prove that those coefficients were actually significant. And so they could claim that uh, summer temperatures, average summer temperatures over Europe had been changing, and anthropogenic CO2 had a role in changing them. And then uh, what they de did was to take um, climate model simulations over Europe um, of um, summer, daily summer temperature, and they computed the probability of um, extremes from those values, uh, from those simulations. And they came up with two types of distributions. One, when they looked at climate model simulations that didn't have CO2, and um, 
this would be the distribution that says you know, they define some kind of extreme, you know, days above a certain threshold. And they show that under those kind of simulations, the number of occurrence of those days is very rare. It's one to four in thousands of years. And then they looked at the distribution of uh, simulations that included CO2 increases. And they came up with a much, much wider and shifted um, distribution um, where that occurrence is still very rare. You know, it's, it was still a very, very um, ex you know, intense, extreme, even for the simulations that included CO2. But definitely, the chance would be larger um, under this kind of simulations. And then they computed that uh, fraction of attributable risk, which is what is shown here. And um, they showed, of course, it's an uncertain result. It has to do with you know, different numbers of simulations and models and stuff. But um, the distribution of this, uh, of this quantity is um, you know, uh, concentrated, let's say, on values that are uh, greater than 0.5. So it's, it, it's telling us that uh, the effects of CO2 have made uh, uh, the occurrence of such a heat wave at least um, twice as uh, likely than if we didn't have CO2 in the atmosphere. Yes. Or at least with a large probability, twice as likely. For example, for just looking at the black line, there, uh, you can see that you have like a low frequency variability going on there. Shouldn't you try to filter this effect before comparing to the green line? Because yeah, I mean, and, uh, it's done through that um, residual term. So the residual term accounts for this kind of low frequency variability. And so, uh, if it's just low frequency variability that makes the difference between the green curve and the rest, then it's, uh, it's the beta coefficient is not significant. Okay. So I'm not going to the formality very, very um, in, in very much detail, but it's taken into account. And it's actually the crux of, as you can guess, of this detection attribution. And, and so for temperature, where you believe the models to be uh, reliable enough in, in replicating that kind of variability, you trust your results. When you start looking at other quantities, especially extremes, you don't really trust the models to tell you exactly how a undisturbed system would work. And your results would be much less, uh, uh, you would have much less confidence in your results. Any other questions? Are you allowed? Sorry? Are you allowed? <laughs> oh, OK, thanks. Chris says, of course I am. Um, yes. I'm in deep doo-doo. OK. Um, As usual, I'm already at 41 minutes. But anyway. So if this is just changing the, the probability of the event, is there any sense of how much of a shift in the fractional attribution? Let's say the shift had not been you know, to double the likelihood. What if it had only been to increase it by 20%? I have no idea. I, I don't know if there is anything that you know, it probably depends on the on the application if there is any of this stuff. But um, yeah. so then, why? I mean, it's it's kind of interesting. So then, why was the Stout article so convincing? Well, for one thing, it's doubling. So I, I would imagine it's big enough. But um, what if it had been, let's say, only thirty percent? Yeah, you know, what if it is still, you know, a zero point zero 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 one probability? Uh, it's doubled, but it's doubled from a very, very, very small. So there are all these things attached to it. I, I guess the, the value of the of the paper was, for one thing, to to propose the method for the first time and and to show that it could be done for some some events. And then, um, depending on what you use it for, you may have be happy enough or not. But I don't think there is anything formal out there that says, oh, yes, a FAR of uh, 0.5 is good enough. <laughs> yeah. It probably would have been published in Journal of Climate instead of Nature, then. Well, let, let, let's not get there. <laughs> um, uh, well, and then actually the paper shows that you know by 2100, the kind of temperatures that are now that that extreme are going to be uh, cool, but that's just an aside. Um, 
Yeah, so um, that's an approach. So as you as you understand, in that in that approach, you don't even have to try and replicate the actual synoptic situation that drove you know the occurrence of this heat wave and uh, in that particular year. Um, there is an approach that actually tries to do that, and um, it tries to actually use uh, models to mimic exactly what was going on. And, and then take the same models and try to run them in a way that still stays very close to reality, so the trajectory of reality that we actually observe, but does it by driving them with SSTs and sea surface temperatures that have actually been cleaned of the effect of anthropogenic forcing. So, so in this case, you would use uh, atmospheric-only models uh, that are driven by these uh, sea surface temperature. And the idea of doing that is because sea surface temperature, as observed, are supposed to drive you know, the evolution of weather over the next few, I don't know, weeks. Um, so by doing that, you're actually setting yourself, if your model is good enough, to actually see the European heat wave as it happened. And you can do this by perturbing the initial conditions a little bit. You get a big ensemble, and you look at how many times you actually recover a heat wave like the one that you um, experience. And then you take the same model, the same SSTs, except you estimate the portion of the SSTs that has to do with the anthropogenic warming, the long-term warming. Take that away, and now you run your model with this new set of SSTs that are the world that might have been if we hadn't warmed the SSTs by emitting CO2. So as you can imagine, in that step, there is something to be decided, which is how do you clean out the effect of anthropogenic forcing from SSTs? And there are all these methods that are, have to do with detection attribution again, where they, you estimate the fingerprint of um, anthropogenic forcing on SSDs, and then you take that away, and, and blah, 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 blah. I'm not going into the details, but they are all steps that have to uh, have in themselves some, some kind of uncertainty, because I can come up with my model that tells you that the fingerprint is this, and the model next door maybe has a slightly different fingerprint, and so on. My SSDs of the world that might have been maybe a little different from ours. But the idea is this, and you run these big ensembles, and again, you count how many times you find a heat wave um, in one or the other, and you compute the change in risk. Actually, this, uh, this approach was, was used for the first time in this other paper that had to do with floods in the UK. And it's not just uh, by chance. The, the idea is that you know floods are driven by much more specific um, uh, conditions and precipitation has this much more like small scale uh, nature. And so you really want your model to replicate as, as good as possible the synoptic situation that was in, in um, uh, that, that was happening at the time of the floods. And so um, that's why this, this approach was developed, where you don't just look at simulations of coupled models and try to find episodes that look like the flood of the UK, but you try to actually replicate it as much as possible. So that's another um, way to do it. And um, this panel just shows how, they, how the fingerprints of SSTs look that they used to clean out the effects of greenhouse gases, but I'm not going into the details. This just shows that there are four, at least four different ways to do it. And uh, so that introduces uncertainty. They did them all. They ran ensembles that include all of the possibilities to try and map the uncertainty as much as possible. And what they did was to apply, all of a sudden, I see my, my I, see, I can hear my voice echo, but it's because everything has turned around. Sorry. Sorry for those that are listening, those two people that are listening. <laughs> um, so you know they ran all these simulations and they had ensembles of them, and um, they uh, compute this uh, extreme value distribution for uh, um, large floods of the kind that were observed. And in these panels, they just show the different results that you get from different ways of cleaning out those SSTs uh, of the anthropogenic forcing. And the lower part here has to do with the natural and the blue one has to do with forced. 
And in all cases, they show you that for the same return period, let's say 10 years, the amount of the runoff would be much larger under anthropogenic conditions than not. And so again, it's an, a slightly different way to talk about uh, increases in risk. Um, so I'm skipping this because I, for once, I would like to get to the projections. but. Uh, so this was, this was the study. Uh, it, it's by Perdi Paul et al. Um, if you want to, I, I, I'm, I'm sure it's in the bibliography. And then there are other ways to do this that don't really get caught into this idea of computing probabilities. Um, they are more interested in just talking about, you know, what is driving these events? Can we understand what the processes were at play? And um, uh, this is a study in particular about the Russian heat wave. And for one thing, they, they start by looking at trends, long-term trends on um, summer temperature in Russia, and they find that there is no long-term trend. So it's kind of hard to then start talking about attributing the heat wave in a situation where anthropogenic greenhouse gases have not been shown to actually warm temperatures on average, right? Um, but aside from that, they go on to actually try to explain why the heat wave was so severe. They talk about you know, land processes, dry, uh, droughts, and uh, things like that. Uh, and they also, in particular, talk about blocking and the effects of these uh, high-pressure domes that sat on the, on the area for that long, and it was so intense, and the, the heat was just unrelenting. And so, um, and they show that these kind of events happened in the past. In fact, they have some here that show that, you know, not exactly the same intensity as this dot that, that signals the, the observed in 2010, but uh, there were still some large excursion from um, the normal uh, back in the days, even, you know, in the early 1900s. So um, their point was that, yes, it was an extreme event, but we have some in the past that look more or less the same. And so um, they didn't feel like it was a really big case uh, for attribution in this case. But then another paper came out contradicting them because they showed that, yeah, maybe it's true that the occurrence was not really affected. But if you look at the intensity, you can claim that you know the, there is some contribution. And so that was an example where it was fairly clear that when you talk about attribution, you have really to be careful about what, what you are attributing. Are you attributing just the risk of occurrence? Are you attributing the risk of occurrence and that level of intensity? Um, it's, it's open for a lot of uh, misinterpretations. But the main point here is that these kind of studies, are, again, are not there to try and quantify risk. They are more about quantifying, um, characterizing the effects of different causes. Um, and um, it's, a, it's a slightly different approach to event attribution that has more to do, in my, in my mind, with educating the public on what are you know, the, the causes of some events, uh, rather than being very specific about the risk of them. Five minutes, and no way. <laughs> OK, I'm going to skip everything. But no, no. Yeah, OK. Linda says I can go for 10. Um, um, the, what I meant to tell you is that there is a, um, OK, uh, the, the, the idea of event attribution has become kind of a um, industry now. And uh, there are a lot of people doing event attribution. and. Um, what has been decided a couple of years ago is that every year now, the bulletin of the American Meteorological Society is going to have, in September, so fairly soon, a special issue that um, collects all the studies that have looked at extremes in the past year. So in this case, uh, for this, um, this was published in 2013, but the events are those of 2012. So if you go and look at this, you, there are a lot of papers looking at many events. If you remember, the 2012 was a very hot year in the, in the US, and so there are a lot of studies looking at that heat. 
over the US, but it's global, so you find also other events that have affected other parts of the globe, not only uh, the US. And it gives you a pretty good idea of all the different approaches and also all the differences that can come up when looking at the same event if you specify you know, that you are after one aspect rather than the other. And unfortunately, even if you specify that you are after the same aspect, there is a lot of uncertainty in these results. And, and it's kind of interesting to look through. And there is one for, from the previous year. And in September, there will be the one that looks at events for 2013. Projections. So maybe I, I can actually talk about projections very quickly. Um, unless somebody has some burning question about event attribution. No. Um, so, so the idea for the last few slides is to just talk in general about what we see in model simulations for changes in extremes when we look at the rest of the 21st century. And um, so first of all, you have to define extremes, right? And, and uh, that's, a, that's a problem, because uh, for any application, there is an extreme of relevance. And uh, I'm talking about what the IPCC says. And so the IPCC tries to have this more you know, uh, removed view and try to talk about, at least in our, in our chapter that was the global projections chapter, um, to, to try and define extremes in a fairly abstract way. And, and so you can do that in at least two different ways. You can use extreme value statistics and talk about return levels and return periods. Or you can just define indices that somehow get at aspects of extremes. And um, uh, examples of those that are out there in the literature are things like frost days, number of days during the year where temperature goes below 0 C that can be you know, extreme enough to affect your crops, or uh, actually could be good enough to kill your pests, uh, things like that. Um, number of consecutive dry days, maximum five-day precipitation. So these are indices that the community has identified, and they are computed fairly regularly from model output. You can go to the archives of model output and get your um, uh, output from these kind of quantities. Uh, besides average temperature and precipitation and things like that. So just a quick overview. Uh, in our chapter of, of global projections, we actually show these, some of these indices. And for this, you know, what, what you have to do is really what you can do um, is just take the Bute model ensemble, look at the mean projections, compute some form of consensus that have to do with you know, the number of models that show a significant change. and um, and those are the dots that you see there. But my main point here is that for these kind of quantities that are still fairly benign, they are not extreme extremes, um, we feel fairly comfortable, first of all, looking at model outputs, because we believe that at this level of extreme behavior, models are still fairly um, reliable. Um, and uh, we we feel fairly comfortable looking at it like we look at average temperature and precipitation, just showing you a model, a multi-model mean and some form of, um, of um, variability around that. And um, this is, um, these are time series, of course. I think these are aggregated over land areas. And they show you changes in this aggregate measure of this index for the different scenarios, uh, red being the RCP 8.5, which is the highest one. Um, and uh, blue being the scenario that actually um, even um, assumes negative emissions after 2050, which is a fairly um, you know, optimistic thing to, to assume. <laughs> um, and so you see the things leveling off there. OK, so this is one way um, IPCC shows the projections of extremes. And the other way is to actually look at um, return levels. So somebody has gone in and taken daily um, output and looked at um, extreme value distributions of things like maximum temperature or minimum temperature, computed, fair, again, fairly benign. This is a 20-year return value. So it's the event that you would expect only with a chance of 1 in 20 every year or 1 every 20 years. And um, this shows you the change in that value by the end of the century under the different scenarios. So you know, uh, color like this is telling you that the 
event that you expect on average every 20 year in this location for maximum tem in terms of maximum an annual temperature is um, getting hotter by 11 or 10, 10 degrees C. Um, so that's another way to characterize um, changes. And this is, of course, again, some form of multimodal mean change. Um, there would be more to talk about in terms of uh, the range of, of model um, projections here. But um, like it has already been mentioned, you know, given that this is a, a meeting about uncertainty, uh, it would be very um, dishonest to just show those maps and say we are happy with those measures and, and, and that's it. Uh, so like Steve was saying, you know, this multimodal ensemble we have to characterize these changes is not a random sample, it's not a systematic sample. The models are not independent of each other. Um, some models are probably better at simulating these things as other, than others. Actually, Chris was on the model evaluation chapter, so he can tell you all stories about the different model um, reliabilities. How do we take that into account? Nobody has come up with a good idea about that. And so showing mo model means or model ranges has a very limited effect, especially for quantities like extremes, where you really expect that models may have very different um, performance. And, and so that's you know, a, very, a, a big obstacle if you try to characterize uncertainty in these future projections. Um, you know, it's really hard to write down a statistical model to incorporate model output uh, for a given quantity and uh, um, what do you say, account for all these, these idiosyncrasies of, of this sample. So um, I'm not going to show you this. This was just to the point that different models have different reliability and we don't take that into account when we show those maps. Every model gets one vote and, and, and everybody is happy. Um, what I want to conclude with is just one possible way to try and at least get a first step in the characterization of uncertainty, which to me has to have to do, has to have to do with um, characterizing uncertainty on quantities that we feel more comfortable characterizing uncertainty on. And to me, that remains global average temperature change. There is very little else that I have confidence in attaching uncertainty to quantitatively. And the reason I'm more comfortable doing that for global average temperature is that for that, I can use simplified models. I can use all sorts of interesting you know, designed um, uh, experiments, like the perturbed physics experiments. I have all sorts of tools to explore uncertainties a little more systematically, a little more completely. Um, everything else requires more complicated models. And so if I characterize uncertainty in global average temperature, which, by the way, is the only quantity I think in, the, in the IPCC report uh, where probabilities are attached to the projections and, and not by chance. Um, and if I can then link changes, at least to first order, in extremes to changes in global average temperature, then I may be a, a step closer to say something about uncertainty in extremes. But of course, you know, you see it's a very limited approach and it has all its uh, shortcomings. First of all, you need to be able to link this extreme behavior to global average temperature, which is very difficult. And, um, and again, uh, you, you need to uh, be reliant on your way to characterize the uncertainty in global average temperature. So um, this is the recipe. Yes, uh, I think I have just one, one more slide. Uh, I wanted to show how uh, we did this for um, storm surges. And so th this is actually a multi-step process because we first linked global average temperature change to sea level rise, global sea level rise, through one of those empirical models that are uh, very controversial. So if you don't accept those empirical models, like Rob Wilby is like doing <laughs> this with his uh, eyebrows, um, uh, then um, we, can, we can stop here. But the, the attractiveness of that, especially because we limit our um, projections to 2030 and 2050, so it's not as big an extrapolation as others, is that you can use global average temperature to tell you something about sea level rise. 
And then we link sea level rise at the global level to local via downscaling exercise, statistical downscaling. And then, so then we can say what's you know, the range of um, sea level rise at the local level that we expect by 2030 and 2050 in terms of our probability distribution. And then we can compute our return level curve from observations to, of extreme water levels. And this would be the green curve here that tells you, know, you know, in this location, the 10-year return level is about a meter and a half, let's say. And then we can impose just additively, just as a shift uniformly upward, the sea level rise in 2030 or in 2050, and simply say that, for example, you know, what was a 100-year event, uh, this is, uh, this is, uh, you know, this, this is okay, a 100-year event now, just by the effect of sea level rise in 2050, is going to be more like a 20-year event. Yeah. Okay. So did say that you're just keeping the same distribution and adding sea level rise to it. Um, do you have any sense for how those distributions might shift yeah, with climate change? Yeah, of course. We published this, so what, this was one of the first comments in, uh, by the reviewers. And, and actually, um, there is definitely the possibility of, of changes in variability and the storms being stronger and things like that. But to, um, we, we found literature that said that for first approximation, the largest effect is going to be from sea level rise. And so we, we got the paper out. You know, through the process. Now, if you if you live in a location where you have seen already changes in storms, you may be less less uh, convinced by this. But at least uh, this was an IPCC statement, and and uh, there is some uh, paper that shows that that's the case. So, and it's all done, you know, statistically. So all the uncertainties are trickling down and taken into account. Blah blah blah. blah. So, so we come up with those big ranges of uncertainties around it as well. And I'm conclu concluding here also because I'm getting really, really dry mouthed, so I'm not even Who able. Water? Who's having water runner? <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he doubles as a microphone runner, but he can he can do the water run. Thank you. That's it.